I need to talk. I mean, I don't sound like a, a dog that sounds like a dog. Casey I saw about two or three years ago. And Casey's family brought me uh, Casey in order to heal up a couple of problems that Casey had. Number one, Casey was very, very depressed and they couldn't figure out why he was so depressed and he wouldn't come home. And they couldn't understand what was the problem. I found out that the family had a restaurant and that Casey got to go to work every single day with its owners. They would go inside and cook the food and wait on the people, and Casey's job was to stay right outside the door and greet them as they came in. And it was a very important job for Casey. Then somebody set fire to that restaurant, and Casey had to stay home. He didn't have a job any longer. The animal told me that uh, he needed to work, that it was very important for him to meet people and go to work. And his owners didn't know that that was that important to him. Well, she informed us that Casey was angry because he lost, I think the, the essence was that he lost his job. I said, job, you know, like what job? <laughs> he was a cat. The idea of an animal needing a place to go every day to do some kind of work was certainly a new concept. <laughs> but obviously, for him, it, made, that, it really made a lot of sense. Yeah. It made a lot of sense at the time because we did bring him down, and that was his job. And according to Samantha, Casey waited, thinking that he would someday get to go back there and get his job back. And he waited and he waited, and that time never came. Casey became very sad, and he went out on his own and found a new job. And his job was at the public library now. And he would hang out at the public library all day and greet people. And that was wonderful. He was there from the time they opened in the morning till the time they closed at night. He spent probably a, a year there. And then at Christmas time, they put a sign up on the front door, and Casey was no longer allowed to go into the library. So there we were again. Casey didn't have a job. And then all of a sudden, Casey's whole personality made major changes, and he became extremely sad kind of like, you know how you feel when you're unemployed, the pits? Well, Casey was a little bit in the pits because he couldn't find a new job. So we literally created a new job for him. And now he goes and he visits these older people that are lonely every day now. I felt a little bit skeptical at first, but there were certain revelations that she made concerning these animals that she, she wouldn't have known about, and I knew of, I knew about, that there would be no way that she could have in any way fabricated. The thing that convinced me was when we actually were in the presence of the goats and she began to relate to us events that they in turn were relating to her and the nature of these events and the specificity of the information was such that it clearly communicated to me that she has this capability this is bianca i wanted to see samantha to find out what would bianca like to tell us samantha said this she told me that in your home is the stuffed floppy gray rabbit. 
And she's, I said, what? <laughs> no, I've never met Samantha. And Samantha's never been to our home, right? She described it. She said, gray, and it's stuffed, and it's floppy. And I said, I don't believe what I'm hearing. This really, it, it scared me partly, and yet it was amazing. And yes, it was sitting on the sofa in our bedroom right behind Bianca's bed. Actually, I've had this rabbit 16 years. I've had her longer than Bianca, and it was just sitting on the sofa. And our Samantha actually told me that this is what she wanted in bed with her at night. So that night, I put the rabbit in bed with her. She's been sleeping with it ever since. The first time I took Rugby to see Samantha was mainly out of curiosity for me, because I'd heard about her. And um, at the time, I was going out with someone. But apparently, Rugby told Samantha that um, he didn't think it was a very good idea for me to go out with this guy anymore. And um, he said that uh, he was concerned about me because I forget exactly what his words were, but something like this was not for my highest and best. And in Rugby's opinion, the relationship should end. Which it did, and Rugby was right. <laughs> but it took me a few more months to figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, he, that was good advice from my dog. <laughs> I can readily accept what Samantha does because I experience it for myself. The goats are very particular about what they eat. Unlike the myth that they will eat anything, they will not eat anything. And they won't eat anything that's soiled. Once it touches the ground, forget it. They will not touch it. But they have a habit of taking the food, grabbing it out of the feeder, and then turning away somewhere. Half of it fell on the ground, and it was costing us an enormous amount of money, plus the cleaning out process, because so much of it would fall on the ground, and they wouldn't touch it once it had fallen. So we're trying to get them to be a little more thrifty in their eating habits. And uh, Samantha communicated that to them, and it actually pointed out to the, the Dolings bunny and lady that since they were smaller than the big girls, they could eat off the bottom trough where all the leaves were falling down. And that also they should eat the stems, too, and not just the flowers and the leaves. And immediately, Lady and Bunny started to eat down on the trough, you know, at the bottom of the feeder. And I could see in the days that followed that they were having stems in their mouth, not just nibbling on the flowers and the leaves. So it, it has been helpful. My name is Frank Tuffarello, and uh, I train thoroughbred racehorses at Belmont Racetrack in New York. And uh, when uh, we had first arranged for Samantha to come to the barn, I didn't tell any of my owners that she was coming because I re they might think I was crazy. Well, the very first horse that um, I had Samantha look at was a horse called Raise the Bet. And this horse just didn't want to train. He was biting and kicking everybody, just being nasty. And um, I had asked Samantha, you know, to try and find out what was bothering this horse. So uh, she, sp she spent some time, about a half hour with the horse, and I went over and asked her um, how things were going. And she said things were fine. She said, uh, but this horse is pretty angry with you. And I was kind of taken back by it. and. Um, I asked her why, and she told me, well, he had been in training for an extensive period of time, over two years. He hadn't had any rest, and he needed a rest. He wanted to go out in the field and run around and play. And um, I said to Samantha, well, that's, you know, that's not right, because he had just been turned out about six weeks previously on the owner's farm, and he was given a rest. And now he was just back in training a couple of weeks. So she went back to raise a bet, and. Uh, came back to me and said, that, well, according to him, that's not true. He was being trained on the farm, and he has not had a rest. So I kind of smiled and told Samantha, well, let's call the owner. And I called the owner, and I said, Jerry, I know you're going to think I'm ridiculous, but I have somebody here who's communicating with Raise the Bet, 
And I have to ask you, if the, when he was on the farm, did you, did you turn him out like we had said? And there was silence on the other end of the phone. And I said, Jerry, what, you know, what happened? And he said to me, well, I didn't want to tell you, but my trainer on the farm said that there was no horse that he couldn't train. And he said, um, I'm going to make this horse train. And he put spurs on, and he, and he just um, did what he had to do to make the horse train. And the horse wasn't turned out. So we went back to raise a bet, and we wound up making a deal with him where he had to run a race in three or four days. And we said, well, you run this race. You don't have to win, but at least try in the race. And then after the race, we would give him a vacation. And, and that's what happened. Yes, sir. I'm going to take him out. Yes, sir. You're going to be all right, big boy. Yeah, I know. This has been kind of wild for you, huh? Traveling in a taxi and and all the things that your mommy cares enough about you that she wants you to get all feeling terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can get down and check everything out. I don't mind. And the kitty's name is? Tonga. Tonga. Okay, and what are the biggest problems that you have? He's very um, aggressive. He bites and scratches a lot, and sometimes he'll come over and just stare at you for a long time and then I know he's getting ready to like bite or scratch or sometimes he'll just do it completely out of the blue and just run over and bite me. Well, I'll find out from him what it is and why he's doing that. Now, how I work is um, he's going to spend 45 minutes with me mm -hmm. and in that 45 minutes, not only am I going to talk to him, but I'm going to go back and see if I can find out when it started and get some clear information on how he feels and some other information about his life. And then you'll be back, and then I'll give you a readout. Okay. Okay? Bye, Tonga. Have any idea what you expect to happen today? Oh, well, I expect that Tonga will speak with Samantha and, you know, be unladen of his psychic burden and he'll come home a happy, docile cat. Do you believe that that's really possible? No. <laughs> but it would be nice. Do you know, with my hand here, do you know how scared you get? You know that? Do you know that when you bite someone's hand, they get as scared? Uh-huh, and you cannot bite people. No, and you cannot swat them. She's going to get you some real nice toys that will bounce all over, and you can attack and swat those. Okay? But let's get the rest of this out. We have a little more to get out. That's not going to come close to you. No. And you can growl. Go ahead. You can growl and you can... No, 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 no. It's all right. It's all right. Hang in there. Hang in there with me. I promise I won't hurt you. I know how hard this is. Okay. And she's going to be coming in in a minute. Yeah. Okay, now let me finish up this side. And then we'll let her in, okay? Now we're going to get to that spot that's uncomfortable, so you have to sit real steady. And if you get uncomfortable, stick your nails in my pants. Yeah, I know, baby boy. I know. Okay, we're about ready to get down here. Okay, now let's go get his owner in here. All right, 
to... Um... What I did was I worked with Tonga, basically giving him, started out with giving him pictures about biting. And how you do this is animals think in pictures or visual images. And in, in your mind, if you can give him a picture of what it is that you would like him to do, he will be able to pick up your impressions or visual images very, very quickly. As I was working with him, I found that he has two things going. One of a fun nature regarding hands and one of a terror nature regarding hands. So I decided to start activating the part of the terror and uh, of being frightened. Uh, with somebody coming at him. So what happened is we went back in time. I literally saw him being taken. I think it was, uh, he talked about it being a male that had picked him up and grabbed him. That particular incident is the incident that is traumatic for him. So he has a couple of areas on the back that he gets highly activated when you pet him, then what it does is it continually triggers this uncomfortable memory. I have told him that he hurts us by biting and that he has to quit that and that hurts as much as his back, okay? Um, oh, then he started telling me about your shower curtain. I know what it is <laughs> about the shower curtain. He loves that shower curtain. Oh, yeah. It's full and of holes. I and he know. likes the bathtub, too. Yes. Yes, that's his more special area. Well, <laughs> Tonga was definitely a changed cat after seeing Samantha. He was very, very calm, very relaxed. Um, he was almost as if he was on tranquilizers. And his aggressive habits started to come back after that initial week but he was never as aggressive and hostile as he had been prior to his visit to samantha he definitely calmed down a lot and released some kind of trauma or hostility or something I work with so many animals that have emotional problems, they're stressed out. The primary function that I do is to help heal them up. Well, honey, you are beautiful. This is Cora. Hi, Cora. How are you? Animals are extremely sensitive, and they're totally aware of their environment much more than people realize. They also remember their past. They're affected by every single thing that has ever happened to them, the same way we are. So we're gonna work on basically... Animals basically record information visually. They use nonverbal communication, mind to mind, uh, visual impressions, feelings, and uh, pictures back and forth. It's like your mind has an eye, and you let that mind's eye give the visions. And when you do that, information will come back to you. I worked with uh, several of the elephants at the San Diego Zoo. Maya is an Asian elephant. She's about 75 years of age. We talked for a little bit, and I walked away. She took her big, huge leg, and she swung it to hit me. And the keepers had to push her off. She did that twice. And I turned, and I asked her what the problem was. And she informed me that she wasn't finished talking, and that I rudely just turned and walked away. What I did was I apologized. My behavior was completely off. And I mean, I sincerely, with all of my heart, apologized to this great, intelligent being. As I apologized to her, she bowed. She went all the way to the ground. 
and the keepers were so surprised they said they never saw her do that she said that she had bad feet and they hurt her and she wanted me to communicate that to her keepers so i did a little bit of pet massage on the bottoms of her feet and around her whole nails and she was so grateful anyway i finished all the footwork showed the keepers how to do that kind of massage and now every day they get to have the bottoms of their feet worked with and massaged and she's very very pleased my dream when I was a little girl was to someday work with animals that was my dream and I knew that I had uh, something special with them I didn't know quite what it was I just knew that I wanted to be with them When I was a little girl, I was very tuned into animals. I had a very rugged childhood. And so the animals, my dogs, really provided the emotional nurturing for me that a parent would normally nurture. But I didn't have the parents to nurture me that way. I was adopted at five years old. And um, we never talked about my parents or my dad. To this day, I don't know who he is. There are periods in my life that were pretty emotionally devastating to me. When I was adopted is um, when I bonded with the animals. They were always there emotionally, no matter what state I was in. And that was uh, the refuge that I could go to. And I talked to my dog, and my dog listened, and I shared everything with my dog. And as I grew up, we were best friends. I never grew away from that. Not only did I bond with them, but I believed always, I still do, that we are equal beings. I do not see the animal kingdom as separate from myself. And that's why we can communicate. When Samantha comes in to my house, which now has, as I said, um, three cats, two dogs, and a rabbit. It's like somebody coming into, it's, it, it's rather like what the fantasy of St. Francis of Assisi, you know, just all the animals gather around. They really do come right over to her, and um, they really know who she is to them. This is... This is Keep It Easy. Keep It Easy? Mm -hmm. Keep It Easy, wow. Okay, Keep It Easy. I want to immediately go in here and work on this chest. Uh, yes, I know. I know we've got problems on this chest. And, um, and it seems to me that there's something on more of the uh, right side than, or the left side than the right side. I'm not too sure until I get in and touch and then I ask some questions. But I, I feel something like off on that chest right away, immediately. Uh -huh. And uh, you're gonna let me touch you, sweetheart? <laughs> 
Okay, let's see what you got. All right, I'm, my bod's starting to get uncomfortable now. It seems to be a higher. I feel like there's something way up inside. It's almost like my when I turn into my chest and his chest and this side, it's like I get winded and that part is very heavy and I don't feel real good right there. Um, and it's all, uh, it's probably his physical heart or the lung. If I was running, I would have, um, probably a small pain in my heart. Well, what do you, he, um, he has a problem with his valves in his heart. My valves in the heart, no wonder. He has a murmur. He has a heart murmur? About two months ago, he was yeah. given an EKG and he was given a sonogram and they found that his valves just don't work properly. Yeah, and it feels but to me like the right ventricle feels like it's the, it's, it feels like it's the one, and check with them. Ask okay. the vet, call the vet. She walked in immediately. She sensed that there was something in his chest. He didn't know exactly what it was, and eventually came to his heart. And I'm not positive, but I think she picked the ventricle also that was bothering him. Yes, tell us the truth. Yes, we're going to work together. Boy, oh, we're talking. Be careful with me, and I want to get very quiet and soft and back off and, you know, don't come at me real fast. And, boy, she just is, uh, she's very apprehensive, and I almost feel sad, and I don't know why yet. Also, this one is another one that needs to be outside just a little bit more. You know, just out there, even. Uh, it's in the stall too much. This She's one? tried to jump out of the stall. She needs to go out. That's, That's why what we have a gate on her. We had to put a gate up because she tried to jump over the top of the webbing and she got her legs caught. Wouldn't it well, be easier if you just took her outside? <laughs> <laughs> she also digs a lot, Samantha. She you think she's trying to tunnel out now? It's just, a, uh, it's like, it's like she says, if I keep trying, just quietly keep trying. Maybe you'll pay attention to me. Yeah. That's what it is. So you need to get her outside. She needs to see the sunshine and the wind. And... Okay. Hold steady here. And they're going to take you out. You're going to get to go outside. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the trees. Yeah. Yeah, you smell that? Whoa. And then she'll run better, too. And she'll stop all the other stuff. You can look at it. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Oh, <laughs> sweetheart. Uh, I saw the uh, lady, uh, Samantha. Samantha, uh, talking to the, you know, in pictures, you know, uh, to the animals. And uh, it's very interesting. I like it. I, I've always uh, tried to figure out what they were thinking uh, when he is, you know, trying to. Every time you get underneath a horse, you know, you always try to picture what's going on in his mind. What's this one say? Veil Run. Veil Run? Whoa, what a beautiful name. I guess I will cuddle you. This one needs an off right away. It needs a lot of love, a lot of reassurance. Uh, let me get in here and start working with her. Since she's been here, she sick. came in here on Sunday. It's okay. It's okay. Uh -huh. She hasn't eaten since so she's been here. Okay, I'll get her to start eating and let me talk to her.
she likes to run. So I'm telling her that when she starts to eat again, yes, that she's going to get to run. Yeah. Well, you want to climb in my pocket, huh? Well, I, if you were a little smaller, I'd love it if you climbed in my pocket. And you know you have to eat. about ready to go in. I hope so. I think so. <laughs> Remember sugar. This one's uh, sweet oriented. Okay. Mm. Yes. I think as far as people being skeptical, when they see the kind of results that I've seen with Samantha, I think they have to start to accept more what she's capable of doing. And I think they will as they're exposed to it more and more. Growing up with my mom, um, I lived in, in the household with her, and she wasn't working with animals as a regular job. They just were in our household, and we were forever bringing in a stray, not only dogs and cats and birds and rats. <laughs> we were in high school, and my brother had seen a pheasant that had gotten hit by a car, and he brought it to mom. As I worked with this pheasant, uh, it started giving me pictures of it flying, literally, flying over the field, and I could see the ground and the weeds, and, uh, and I had never flown. <gasps> and I knew that was the first time that that information and impressions and visual information was not in my past memory, because I hadn't done this. And that was the massive turnaround in the fact that we could communicate. Now, when I first got that information, I didn't recognize that I could give information back. But how um, did you feel when you... I felt, I felt incredibly free. I yeah, felt... It was a shock. It, was, it wasn't exactly a shock at the time. It was, uh, afterwards, it was a sheer joy. After, and I can remember now, and you know, then a little bit, but now I look back and, you know, we saw the movies with Merlin and, um, uh, who was it, uh, Merlin teaching King Arthur about the animals and about becoming the eagle and becoming the different beings. And I experienced, like, becoming that being in that experience of, of the visual information that was transmitted to my brain. And I could see what it, and feel what it felt like to fly. Is that your first recollection? Of, yeah, of mom really working with an animal as the, the pictures, of sending the information back and forth. That was the very first time that Samantha had ever gotten that. And then she took it from there and she started working with all the animals in the neighborhood now here, you've got a problem, give it to me. Let me see if I can work on it. And it was almost like a game. Let's see if I can get some information from this animal. So we've been working on that. And, and that's when I started to think, you know, this isn't the regular family that everybody else has. Yeah. It was the very first date that me and Heidi had had. She had told me before we even started dating, I think the very first time we ever really talked, I'm a little bit different, and, you know, my household's a little bit different. So I asked her, well, what does your mom do? And she told me a little bit about it. And when somebody says something like that to you, that this, this lady, my mother, communicates with animals. She, she reads their minds, and they talk to her. I mean, being a skeptic, I think like most people, I just kind of thought, no, what is this? You know, you, you, you tend to think the, the loony bin going on here. I walked out to my car, and I <laughs> sat there. I didn't start up. Start the car, by the way. I just sat there and thought, 
should I come back to this house? I mean, this is pretty strange. The way she talks to him, and this lady gets right down on the floor and talks to them like they're human beings. And, and we can do exercise. You want to do exercises? Okay, Rodney, come on. Rodney, ready? Nikki, come and do it with Nanny. One, two. Come on, Rod. Yep. Ready? Put your wings out, though. You're not putting your wings out. Come on, Rodney. One, two, three. Tom put his wings out. He's not he's cheating. I can think of one time when where she wanted her cats to come in. We were sitting in the living room, and she said, geez, I wonder where, I think it was Peaches. No, it was JJ. I wonder where JJ is. And she says, I'm just going to think about him, you know, coming in and sitting in my lap. And five minutes later, here comes this cat from wherever. I was outside somewhere. Well, she walked right in, walked through the house, jumped up on her lap, and I thought, wow, that's something. So, yeah, it, it, it took time, but just, just seeing her with her own animals, not so much clients' animals, but her animals, I really got to... To thinking this is really, it can happen. I mean, it is possible. Jay, come on over here, please. Come on. Thank you. This is my guy. Purring. <laughs> Come on, baby boy. Tammy's a desert turtle, and I've had her here three months now. Michael, come on over here and meet everybody. Yeah, he has to think about it, and then he may come over. <coughs> Hi, Sonny. That's an Ada dog. Sonny is fascinated with uh, this yard and all the activity. Uh -huh. Comes up and visits. <laughs> Looks over. All together, we've got uh, 11 kitties now that I feed. Not all of them are my own. I have a lot of what I call transient cats, and they're stray cats that we put food out. Also put food out for the ants here. And then when I first moved here, I had my first experience of what a battle with ants was like, a war. It was a war. And um, no one was winning, you know. And I got up one morning, and they attacked my refrigerator. And they were inside the refrigerator and the freezer, you know, trying to get just the, like this wall of dark little spots. And that's when I finally said, hey, hey no way, I'm not playing. The war is not here. And uh, you have 24 hours to get out of my house. If you're not out of my house by 24 hours, I will spray. But it will be the last time I ever do that. And I'll give you a length of time to do it, and I'll feed you outside. And I'll continue to feed you as long as I live here. And I've kept my promise, and they won't come in. So what I'm trying to create in my environment is uh, a working relationship with all species. You know, to let put it into actual practice, the belief of having heaven on earth in one single little environment where the cats don't uh, attack the birds or, or the turtle feels safe or there's a curiosity of one species to another and, and uh, they get to explore that. <laughs> this is Toodles. Toodles, all these people are going to look at you. And yes. And Toodles had an owner that gave her too much medication, and the feathers all fell out. And so they were going to put her to sleep just because her feathers fell out. So anyway, we told Toodles that we would keep her, and she didn't have to have feathers. To us, Toodles is a um, like a little E.T. Toodles, would you put your head in my hand and show them? how affectionate you are. Oh, honey. All she wants is to be loved. Yeah. Shall we kiss, kiss, kiss? That's fun. <laughs> anyway, this is Toodles. 
another little being in our group. Who's on the floor? Let me see who's on the floor. Yeah. Oh, that's all. It's just drink. Kitty food. Now I'm gonna get the kitty food. You want the kitty food too? Oh, this is a game we play. It's you flip it over your head and then catch it in your mouth. <laughs> But she does it with littler seeds. Well, you have to flip it farther. Good girl. You have to throw it up a little bit higher. That's it. That's it. I think everyone has the potential to be able to communicate. I really would like to be able to give people the keys in order for it to, to be an experience and be an everyday event instead of being something separate from your own natural ability to communicate. hunting dogs which you have to work very closely with in the field of the telepathic uh, understanding beyond just the conditioning you and the dog and um, also I've done a, quite a bit of falconry so sometimes you have a sort of um, a man bird dog and the game obviously um, team or interplay in which um, I'd like to have the insight of someone who's focusing on telepathy. To send information to animals, I use a simple technique. It's like daydreaming or using a visual aspect of your brain. For instance, it's like you're writing a story about how your cat changed its behavior and started using a cat box. Well, writers always see the visuals in their mind. So what you need to do in a daydream format is see your cat going to the cat box, climbing into the box, digging, and going to the bathroom. When you respect their sensitivity and their intelligence, 
you'll begin to pick up information from them. Then they'll understand better what it is that you want them to do, and they'll change their behavior. Samantha told me to give the, give the goats pictures of what I wanted them to do, and also pictures of what would happen if they did what I didn't want them to do. So the first time Eureka put her foot in the bucket, I kept sending her pictures of if she put her foot in the bucket, I would douse her with the milk. I saw the milk dripping from her face and off her nose and off her neck. And so the picture was very vivid in my mind. So I just remembered that, how it looked in my mind, and I sent it to her. I gave it back to her. I said, this is what you're going to look like if you put your foot in the bucket. If she didn't put her foot in the bucket and she stood real still, then she would get a hug and sweet talk. And I, I visualized hugging her and telling her what a good girl she was. And I did that for about a week. And she hasn't put her foot in the bucket again, and she's been a real good girl. Can we put Tammy on you on your lap? Sure. Okay. On a nice clean blanket. Yeah. yeah. Say Tammy gets to feel this blanket. Yeah, Tammy. Only special little beings get to be mm -hmm. on Nikki's blanket. Yeah. Yeah. Just Tammy. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, Tammy. Tammy bird. <laughs> she did, didn't she? Mm -hmm. I know. I know. Rub her head and let her know that we're gonna. Just put her in her bed in just a few minutes. And just go in your bed in just a few minutes, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, She's just... jiggling me. Okay, well, let's yeah. put her down on the floor. No. And we have to hold her real tight yeah. so that she doesn't get spooked out. Okay, yeah. so let her know we're not going to drop her. No. Okay, there we go, Tam. Nikki, walk. my granddaughter, who's okay. three, she already has a sensitivity and picks up animals communication that's her reality her reality is that humans speak to animals animals speak to humans animals are intelligent animals think animals can speak and so she's going to grow up and think that's normal where for us the possibility if you if somebody hears uh, oh i know this lady in escondido that talks to the animals usually the response is there's no way and a lot of times i assume that i'm considered a little bit of being a little crazy loony person and that will probably stay that way until the next generation of children grows up and that possibility is much more of a reality and they're much more open pa you oh, just yeah. hold steady and then we'll give you your medicine you can fly Open up wide. Come on, and you're gonna go. Come on, come on, open up. Come on. Come on, you did it just a second. That's a baby. That's good. If somebody's skeptical and has an open mind, then they say, okay, you prove it to me. And then uh, if they're not just stuck and prove it to me, but they really are a skeptic, then they can't, then you have an opportunity to, yes, come along and show them something that's a little outside of uh, their way of thinking, thinking, but they'll, it'll make sense to them. She purports to do things that others find not possible. It falls beyond the scope of their body of beliefs, but in our thinking, that does not invalidate anything. Just because a person doesn't believe something to be the case doesn't mean it is not. So, therefore, from a scientific perspective, even though the, the dominant body of scientists may not say, or may say that such things are not possible, doesn't mean that they're not possible. What happens in the meantime when people have certain experiences or certain perceptions which are not scientifically addressable from an empirical perspective? Are, those, are they invalidated? Is it hallucinatory or is it pathological? Or is it factual, but just not explainable? You have to start eating. Otherwise, you're going to get very, very, very sick. Oh, you have Tammy coming. <laughs> hmm.
so for people to um, to really open up and if they can't swallow the belief that their animal is intelligent or we have a possibility to communicate with them I'm hoping that they just won't be so closed-minded that that somehow they just won't shut the door of that not being a real possibility you know Bye-bye.